so welcome to the second lecture in our course fall lecture series. Um, today's talk is going to be about the practical aspects of doing reproducible data analysis. And we're very lucky today to have uh, Jan Volkel, one of our student affiliates of course, to give this talk to us. Um, Jan was a recipient of one of our Open Science Innovators Award um, and has a very impressive track record of doing reproducible science himself, um, both on the empirical side, having led registered reports, um, as well as on kind of the method side, um, trying to create new tools to detect data fabrication. Um, so he's really a perfect individual to be speaking to us today about the hands-on aspects of reproducible data analysis. Uh, please take it away, Jan. Yeah, thanks so much for the opportunity to speak today um, and for all the great work that you're doing um, yeah, so I'm going to share my slides here and okay. All right, can you can you see the slides? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about the practical aspect of reproducible data analysis today, like while I was designing this presentation, you know, like I like realized, you know, like, or like talked a lot about like how different this might be for, for people from different fields dealing with different data issues and different uh, field norms, you know, like I identify as a, as a social scientist who's trying to speak to work in different, in different disciplines. Um, I am a PhD student in the department of sociology um and yeah but uh, but i'm also interacting with researchers from political science uh from, from psychology communication um yeah so and you know like, so like, there's like uh i just want to acknowledge that i like don't know like a, a lot of the um like issues that people from other sciences might be facing and i hope that i designed the talk in a way that still like speak to some of the more general issues while also addressing like very hands-on practical practical issues right so like the goals of my talk are to build on my conceptual talk from last week um identify practical issues and then offer some solutions for these for these practical issues i will operate with a definition of reproducible data analysis, which is very similar um, to the one uh, that Maya used last week. So I will use like someone and you know, they could be yourself or a third party could analyze your data and match your statistical results without your help. And like, like if we, if we think about this, you know, like it's really a sort of necessary condition for believability of scientific results. Like uh, there has been a, this, uh, this great theoretical work by um, Jeremy Fries and um, Peterson uh, on like, like what kind of like different forms of replication there they can be. And they use a scheme that has two dimensions. One is uh, whether people use old or new data to, to try to replicate prior findings and whether they use the same analysis strategy or a different analysis strategy and sort of <laughs> using the same data as the original researcher team and the same analysis strategy as them, which like I hear uh, use the term reproducibility for that they use verifiability It's really like the, 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 the absolute minimum Basically, there would be like other ways and like you could like, like analyze uh, the old data in a different way and see whether results are robust. You could like uh, collect new additional data or use the same analysis strategy to see if the old result is repeatable or even <laughs> you know, do both of these things in new ways, collect new data, have a, have a different analysis strategy and see whether the results generalize um you know it's like it's like uh work for open science certainly doesn't stop with reproducibility but it is a necessary foundation um but you know like even the absolute minimum here is might or might 
<laughs> like not be easy to achieve you know like when i like try to like dig into prior data um you know, by now like uh it is sometimes possible to <laughs> to find posted data sets but even then it's like it can be really really tricky to understand people's code to like find all of the <laughs> necessary pieces to be able to achieve reproducibility like if someone would like to like share a story of like like the of uh of them having tried to like uh reproduce a result and how that went you could you could do that now i would very much invite you to um but but we can also do that uh like potentially in the in the q and a section at the end my own my own experience is that it is really like quite difficult like like not necessarily because of like like uh, intentions to like make this difficult but also you know because it's really tough to like know like which information people need to uh, to be able to re reproduce and so i'll describe this as the audience issue you know who who is the who's the someone in this definition we we don't know it could be like a, a person from a different field from the same field for, like with a lot of knowledge or skills or with less skills and i think like in general you know like when i like write my own code and think about how to make this reproducible i very much think of a person very similar to myself like trying to reproduce my results like or you know, like in, in other words like someone who is the same or, or or better resources and skills than i have for example my future self i mean i i hope that i will have more more skills in the future but um you know, so like, like my my thoughts are usually repro reproducible enough so that i could like 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 uh obtain this the same results in the future but like what about a person with less resources or or skilled, would they also be able to reproduce uh, my um, my findings? So it's really like you know the the uh, the challenge here is like to achieve reproducibility for all or for or for more, um, and the um, you know and you know the, the 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 definition actually has a lot of aspects to it or a lot of potential issues one is that people need to know what the results are in order to reproduce them so that they have something to compare to um they have to have access to the data they have to uh know which uh, which software is being used especially if you uh if you share your code which is usually conditional on a on a certain software and it's also even if you post the code there's the issue of really understanding what the what the person who like wrote the code is trying to achieve in a certain step so i will try to go through these five different issues with some recommendations um i try to like talk to different uh, different examples here i'm not sure like how much i really hit the 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 whole universe of cases but i hope that this is uh, that this is helpful for you all so you know like it's like uh like does does someone who wants to reproduce my findings uh have access to the to the results you know like i mean i will have or the person who conducts the analysis wrote the paper will have access to the same results but it might be that someone else does not have access to the same results and like this like very much overlaps with the issue of <laughs> open access right like there might be a, a person uh, at a different institution who doesn't have access to your paper so they like so they can't even figure out what your results were um or they they might have read a summary about it but they cannot figure out like like what specific results you had so 
like one way to like meet this uh, condition is to provide open access to your paper and the easiest for you and to do that is the so-called uh, green open access route, which is like posting a preprint of uh, of your paper. Um, there, are, there are many ways to achieve that. The easiest, in my experience, or, or like at least at least the one that I've been using is to use the Open Science Framework. Go to this URL um, and uh, uh, sign up for an account if you if you haven't already, and then go through the steps, upload your preprint there, answer some very basic question about uh, who are the <laughs> who are the authors, what's what's the title, um, and like uh, in which field, uh, uh, in in which field are you working, and uh, and uh, submit your preprint there. And if you do that, at least you know like we should meet this very basic condition that everyone who wants to reproduce your uh, your results has access to the specific results. Um, then the next step is, does someone have access to your data? And you know, the person who, who conducts the analysis most probably has access to the data they use. I mean, there's also used, used to be an issue that like the that, that data just would disappear. But if you store your data appropriately, um, then you should have access to it. But if you don't post it, online or if you are not using publicly available data, um, people may not know how to how to access it. And uh, right, so the solution is to have a data availability statement where you say the data for this paper is available your X. Some journals require this already, but I think independent of requirements, it's a great idea to to um, uh, to always have such a statement in your paper. Um, it's also great if you, uh, or if like for, for, for good reasons, you might not be able to, uh, to share the data um, for your paper. And then it's also very helpful to say very clearly like the data for this paper is not available. And then you know, you'll probably not say via X, but because, I like work together with the partner organization and they own the data and do not allow me to <laughs> to share it or for anonymity concerns you know there are good reasons but it is uh it's important to to state this very clearly um all right so like so let's go through this like um for people like myself who conduct experiments we usually collect data ourselves and so we have the possibility of uploading that data set, uh, um, like for example, to the to the open science framework. Um, it is important here to make sure that you're not violating the uh, the uh, the agreement that you have with your participants, so that you make sure that you upload an anonymized data file to whatever repository you are using. However, as soon as you change your raw data file and share it with others, you would want to upload a README data availability file um, where you we can explain that the data file you uploaded is not the raw data file, but is an anonymized uh, an anonymized data file, I usually try to include a statement about why why uh, I do this and what specifically I have changed compared to the raw data file. And I also upload, and I will talk about this more later, the, the code that I've used to, to uh, anonymize the, uh, <laughs> the raw data. So, you know, like providing access to the anonymized data file is great and is important. But you also want to help people understand this data file. And if you have used a questionnaire, like uh, it's a pretty straightforward way to, to just upload the, the questionnaire uh, 
with the uh, with the anonymous data file and upload a readme data understanding file where you say the questionnaire for the uh, anonymized data file is available at this specific URL or and like that's that is usually even more informative is to upload a code book where you really like write down for uh, each of the variables what was the underlying question and then from like like what's the range of possible values how are missing values being being coded that is usually more work but that provides the best understanding um for a person who is uh who's accessing your your data file for the first time so like so that is that is one case when you have the most control over your data set um another case is publicly available data um like data that you have you have downloaded um you know in the, in the social science there are a, there are lots of services that are regularly conducted and that data is generally available to the public sometimes you have to sign agreements but you know like you you don't own the data so you shouldn't upload your own data file but it is possible for most people to uh to access um that data as well and so it's important that you try to describe in as much detail as possible um how you downloaded the data file so that you make sure that whoever is trying to reproduce your results is downloading the exact same data set. You know, the more details you provide, the uh, the lower <laughs> the likelihood of, of misunderstandings here. And it's usually possible, uh, or like usually you also do not have to create your own code book because you can just link to the code book um, for the data that was organized by the organization who has uh, <laughs> who has down uh, who has, who has uh, collected this data in the first place, and yeah, you know, there's also case number three of someone else's private data. Obviously, you know, if you've gotten access to it, you should not upload that data file without their permission. Um, and I would always recommend uploading a readme data file in which you can say i received the data set from x if you want to reproduce my results please contact and then put in some contact information if that is okay and if um whoever gave you access to the data set does not want to stay anonymous if they want to stay anonymous you know like just be just be open about that and acknowledge that it is a, a disadvantage for your paper that it is not possible to reproduce your results and then others have to decide whether that outweighs uh the 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 many other potential benefits that that come from working with uh with with private data such as such as company data or uh, or others um okay so the third issue is uh what i call the software issue so does someone have access to the software um people may not have access to the same software as the person who conducted the <laughs> analysis so it's always good to assume that no one has bought a, a certain license um so the solution is to use open source software that can be downloaded by everyone a few examples are r python or or jazz and I would also encourage you to have a software statement in your paper where you say, we used whatever software you used and the corresponding version for the analysis in this paper. I also think that it's great if you cite whoever has developed uh, this, this, this software so that you can give appropriate credit because, you know, like a lot of people are, are doing great work on, uh, on, um, on, the, on developing the software and we're all benefiting from it. By the way, you know, I don't want to be hypocritical here. Like this is also something that I that I should do uh, that I should do more. Um, right, you know, and you can even like uh, include 
advice on how this software could be <laughs> could be installed you know like especially if you put something like this in the supplementary <laughs> materials or on your uh or in your reproducibility package where there is no space or or word limits um that is that is useful information if someone really like wants to uh reproduce your results and is even willing to to operate with a with a new software i mean you know like like this is just the the access software point obviously there's a whole other point of like being able to to use that that software which is something that i will talk about later on um all right so the next one is the code issue does someone have access to your code um usually not you know like as long as you don't make it if you don't make it available because there's no one else who can make your code uh, available for you um so you know like uh, some some journals require this as well to have a code availability statement i think it's always a great idea um there might be cases where you can't make the code available um because that code would have information uh about the data set that you can't share but you know like in general like like i think like whenever you can it is uh it's really important to share uh, the code for the paper so that even people you know who don't have access to your data set could like check your code for for potential errors um so you know that is still a way to achieve partial reproducibility even if uh uh even if, if you can't share the data file itself okay so what's the solution um to upload your code to a repository once again you know highly recommend um the, the open science framework i would advise you on having two different um coding files one is for like or like you know, this is obviously only if you have to anonymize the data set but if you have to anonymize the data set um i would try to upload that as a separate file um so so that then people can only work with the with the second file and all of that code works you know like i i used to like do it in the way that i would be like okay like here's my entire code step one is the anonymization and it's all in the same file but then you know like if people just run your code it doesn't work right because they don't operate on the on the raw raw data file so yeah so i would i would recommend to have these these two different files the step from the raw data file to the anonymous data file is obviously not reproducible as long as people don't have access to the raw data file um but you're still maximizing transparency because people can see exactly what you did in in that step and then all of the steps from or that that operate on the anonymized data file is reproducible and it makes it very easy for people to start if they start by loading the same data set uh as you do in this file all right the the final point here is the skill and knowledge issue so you know like does someone have your level of skills uh, and knowledge and to what extent is that required to reproduce your your <laughs> results oftentimes you know i mean this is kind of the hardest because it's the hardest to predict right and you know, i think like even if others have like the same the same data analysis or the same coding skills as you do or even better it's still oftentimes unique knowledge that is kind of hidden in the way that one codes stuff so like it's really important to like like if you share uh if you share <laughs> your coding file to not assume that others have um have the same level of skills in coding and or the, the same uh the same knowledge as you do because most likely they don't so like i try to like uh you know like like uh, this is like 
uh, there's a guide for for like how to uh, how to like uh, develop a theory, right? Like I think this this similar version of this uh, quote was attributed to to Einstein when I tried to like give credit for this. Uh, like like I it was really tough to like find out if that was misattributed to uh, to Einstein or not. So you know like I will I will just say like credit to whoever actually said this. Um, and then, I mean, obviously they also like, did not talk about coding, but adapted to coding. It, it is a like code as simply as possible, but no simpler, you know, like, um, like a lot of great coders have like amazing skills, but yeah. <laughs> but you know, like, like uh, it can be really tough to, to, to understand like, like what, what, uh, but true coders often like may see uh, as 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 beautiful code, you know. So like I will I will talk about that more. But my my main my main comment here is to just have as many comments as possible to like try to explain stuff and to have a clear overall structure to your code. I um, I try to use the same structure for every data analysis I do. I mean, obviously, you know, this has this has developed over time and this has changed a few times, but I always try to find that structure that just works for every data analysis I do. So this, so what I call step zero is a download data. Um, if I download the data from from like Qualtrics in this example, I try to describe really like how I downloaded it here so that people can follow of the same steps. Obviously, you know, there's also something that you, that you could put into your data uh, 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 data <laughs> availability, readme file. Um, then the next step is anonymization. The <laughs> step two is exclusion. Step three is recoding and, and preparation. Step four is descriptive results. Step five is results for hypothesis <laughs> testing. Like this can also just be like confirmatory, uh, <laughs> confirmatory tests. And then step six is additional analysis. Um, so, so these are these are not all the code that I would recommend including, but just the but just the blocks of codes that people always know. Okay, like this is being done in this block of where participants are uh, are <laughs> excluded, and then in the, the next block, we're going to recode uh, <laughs> the variables. Um, right? You know, say so I'm I'm not sure how well this this fits for like for the different disciplines. Um, like like I'm I've said I'm an uh, experimentalist. Um, so like. So, so, so the, this has worked well for me, but I would like, like, like I, I hope that this is helpful for you at least as a as a starting point for like, like thinking about how you can uh, how you can structure your code. Um, the next big big advice is to really to try to comment on every single step, um, and yeah, like here's an here's an example. For example, in like like the, the like the like block block four like for like every like uh every command or like every like little block of code here i would recommend including a comment that describes what is it what is done here i think that you know, this this could be even precise you know like i could say um for example, instead of descriptive statistics for age, I could say calculation of the mean age and the uh, standard deviation uh, of age in the sample. Um, another like like very nice feature can be if you um, if you can explain the relationship of what you are doing here to the paper. Um, Nick, Nick, this is this is optimal like if you for example are, are working in in our markdown and you actually like uh like 
can include your code uh, in the write-up as well. But you know, it kind of conflicts with this other principle that I that I mentioned that like that might be already too complicated for um uh, for some. Oh, sorry, like 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 not too complicated, but you know, this may require some like specialized knowledge that some people who want to reproduce your findings may not have. Um, it's also tricky because like if you try to write your uh, if you try to write your code before you collect the data or before you access the data for the first time, for example, as part of a pre-registration, um, then like it's like, obviously hard to anticipate like on which page number, for example, uh, a result is going to appear, right? So you know, like, I like you know, uh, like when I update the uh, the code that I pre pre registered to add additional exploratory analysis, for example, or to correct errors that I have done before. I usually like include a comment that starts with new, so that people know that like this has been added uh, after. I conducted uh, uh, after I collected the data set, um, right? But you know, like, like, like this could be like extremely helpful, so that it's very easy for for readers to like to uh, to like find a certain result that they that they want to reproduce, especially if you uh, if you're running a, a lot of models. Um, Right, but you know, like it, it might also be be a, a lot of work. Okay, so like like this is a somewhat controversial point, I would say, and it is in conflict to what Maya uh, talked about last week. I used to be a big fan of like like uh, like <laughs> sort of like writing this like one script that works for all cases. Um, so that you can really like, like basically rerun the same, uh, the same analysis script over and over again, because you have this, like this like standardized, um, uh, standardized way of doing all of your analysis. Um, I do think, or, you know, it's, it's my experience in the social sciences, um, or also, you know, like, if I like try to go back, like through. For example, if I really like want to find out what a specific package is doing in R, um, for instance, it can be like quite tough to to really like dive into from from function to function. I know that computer scientists are are really uh, into this. When I worked as a as a software engineer for some time, like like I was really pushed to write code that way, and I can appreciate the the beauty and the structure of it. But like, if you want to write code for people who are not very experienced uh, in, in writing code, and this might be the case in the field in which you work, or it might not be, I don't know what the norms are uh, in your field. But if that is the case, um, then it, it might be easier to just like spell out, or it might be more understandable to spell out the specific model that you're running or the specific or the specific operation that you're they're currently doing well, rather than to rely on functions and people who don't know functions would have to learn functions first so like this is sort of a a, a point that i've talked about and the reason why i don't really rely on functions anymore i mean it's obviously you know i still rely on packages so like it's like do i really I mean, I obviously don't really avoid functions, but like for, uh, but I try to like avoid them in in my own coding. I would say. Um, okay, so to to summarize, I have uh, I've like like based on the definition of reproducible data analysis, I've like tried to like really piece out here, what are all of the issues for reproducible data analysis? Like um, all steps where access um, could, be, <laughs> could be lacking. I've talked about the results issue, needing access to the, to the results in the first place, needing access to the data in order to conduct one's own analysis, needing access to the software 
enabled to run the same code and needing the skills and knowledge to understand the code of the, of the original authors. Um, you can see like even to, to, um, to, to get to this level of like reproducible results in the social science or like you know, uh, in, um, uh, for, for scientific papers or results, there are a lot of blocks on, on the road there. I've suggested a few ways for making data analysis more reproducible. It starts with posting preprints so that, so that everyone can see the specific results. Um, it goes over to posting and explaining data sets or at least explaining where the data is coming from if you can to use open source software and uh, and like state clearly what kind of software you are using. Um, posting your code whenever possible, try and like, and try to code as simply as possible to like take whoever is trying to reproduce your, uh, your, your results uh, on your way with you, make it as easy as possible or like require as few skills and knowledge as possible to understand how you, how you derived your results. All right, this is, uh, uh, this is the end of, uh, of my talk here. I, I hope that you, that you learned something, that this was helpful for you. And I very much look forward to, to um, going into the discussion with you all. Thank you, Jan, that was excellent. And I appreciate the alternative perspective as well on functions and kind of the role that those play in interpretability. Um, any questions from the audience at this point? Looks like there's some coming in in the Q&A. So Jan, if you'd like to head over there. Yeah. Um, okay, so the question is, could speaker address how you would code more simply without using functions. Specific example would be fine just to illustrate the point. Okay, so for uh, for example, you know, like I could like, like if I usually use linear regressions with like uh, with two control variables, age, age and gender, I could I could write a function to be able to like to like conduct that that analysis with with one line of code instead of always like estimating the model like and then looking at the at the summary statistics statistics of that model i could write a function that would give me the summary statistics immediately this becomes even more more clear for like for instance if you're interested in interaction analysis where you want to get the the uh, the coefficient for the interaction term, but then you may also be interested in getting the follow up uh, analysis uh, immediately. So there, it can really save you lines of code, but it might be easier to follow if you just like spell out the uh, <laughs> the same specific model for like every time that you that you want to run a model where you control for age or gender or the model to estimate the interaction effect plus every model for the, the follow-up analysis. Um, yeah. I have a question as well. Um, so it's interesting to me that it sounds like in your discipline and the type of research you do, you often have um, kind of identifiable data that you're dealing with. I'm curious if you've ever had a situation where um, the variables that made the data set identifiable, like maybe zip codes, like down to the county level or something like that, actually were necessary for analysis and how, like, what recommendations would you have for scenarios where, you know, maybe you can make some of the data available, but not all of it. And how does that propagate to a reproducible analysis? Yeah. Right, so like I think that there are like different steps. Um, 
<laughs> that you could do. I mean, like, yeah, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like I've, I've never been in like that situation where I conducted those analysis myself, but I tried to be very conservative uh, um, in terms of like potential breaches of uh, anonymity, especially when it, when it comes to like just like unique combinations of basic demographic variables, right? Like, I mean, age like is, uh, is like, like such a tricky <laughs> variable. And if you like, just like cross age and uh, location of variable, such as a zip code, right? You, you can already be in very pretty territory. Like the, the optimal way, right? Would be to try to anticipate that a priori and be like, I'm going to like, if this is a variable that is only uh, like, uh, like of secondary interest for me, I could try to recode that variable and just be like, and that and plan that a priori, right? Like I could like recode age so that everyone above above a certain age is coded like into, for example, like 90 or like 75. There are like publicly available data sets that do that. I could have the same strategy for for zip codes, for instance, that I say, okay, like I'm going to create this larger or this like less precise variable um, to uh, to like avoid uh, an anonymity issues. Um, yeah, so like, like, but like it might also just come up, come up, come up uh, post talk, right? And so like then you know like, you could like exclude like like that analysis from from the code that you're that you're posting. And be and be open about it. Explain your reasoning why you did that. Like if there was really a, like uh, a strong need, right? You could also try to work work out a deal, like where like maybe a specific person who wants to reproduce your analysis gets gets added to the IRB so that they can get get access to the data file as well. Um, but you know, like now. We're also talking about like uh, investing really um, significant uh, amount of resources um, into into a, into a, this analysis, but it might be worth it. So, all right, um, yeah, okay. So this was what if the data set that used by the paper is hard to find, not accessible due to privacy data set concerns? Yeah, like I, I think that they like. Like for you, know, you can have different perspectives on like whether like science should be so strict and um, and only allow publications of of data sets that that can be shared with others, um, like be it in an uh, anonymized way or uh, or. Uh, like even even in its raw form, so there so that there is no step that is not reproducible. Like I think that like that 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 can be a reasonable condition. Uh, sorry, a reasonable position. If you think that like that no like science actually benefits more from like like being able to conduct these not reproducible results. Um, uh, then, then it is being harmed by like, uh, like, like not having strong norms on reproducibility. You can try to like, as I've just said, like, like try to find these individual, um, um, individual based solutions that a specific person might be able to get access to that data set in order to <laughs> reproduce the finding or like, uh, Nick, try to move over to other ways of replicating the data set, for example, by trying to <laughs> collect new but similar data and see if you can replicate that result uh, <laughs> in that way. Um, okay, so could you talk about how to set up your design or IRB request to make some of these reproducibility practices easier? Other design issues to to consider, for example, sampling. Um, yeah, so like I think that like uh, 
that yeah, like, like, like thinking a priori about like like what kind of variables you want to collect in your data and which variables you really need for your data set. I know that a lot of uh, a lot of labs like always always collect a lot of demographic variables, even though it's like not really necessary for the uh, for the specific research question at hand. And you could either like like not do that, or you could say I'm going to uh, to uh, to not include those variables in the data set that I'm going to upload, right? Like that's usually the, the strategy um, that I follow that I like don't include any of the variables that are not important for the analysis that I report in the paper, just to minimize the, the possibility that uh, an an anonymity um, uh, like might be might be breached. Um, yeah, but you know, like, yeah, like I think that like that the thinking about that a priori also like like having a chat with the person from the IRB can be really helpful because I know that IRBs from different institutions really have very different <laughs> opinions on like what what uh, like what uh, anonymity threats <laughs> threats can be. Um, yeah, so like, so yeah, I would also recommend doing that. Any other questions at this point? Great. Well, I think we can thank Jan for a really excellent talk. I thought that was a really nice, uh, very nice overview, um, along with some practical hands-on tips on how to actually implement reproducible data analysis. Um, and so we will look forward to um, seeing you all next week uh, for another lecture in the CORE's fall lecture series. Thank you, Jan, and thank you, everyone. Thank you.